Let's pray. Our Father, as we open the word together this morning, we pray your spirit would do his good work in us, cause us to be receptive to the truth we find here, strengthen us so that we would believe Help us not to grow discouraged when we see our shortcomings, but to recognize the path of life runs right through the cross of Christ, that there is no sin or shortcoming on our, behalf, on our part that the sacrifice of Christ has not fully atoned for. So we can come with confidence, receive the forgiveness and the strength, the hope to go forward. Help us to be a believing people this morning. Father, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. We're continuing our series here on biblical authority and submission and the role of the husband. Beloved, you heard me say this more than once, but I'll say it again because it's so true that it's worth saying again and again and again and again, and that is that marriage is a most wonderful thing. It is an incredible gift of God. It is the oldest and most essential of all human relationships. It was established by God in the sixth day of creation. Marriage is the basis of all human flourishing. Marriage is a good gift, a good gift. But marriage and the marriage relationship serves a purpose beyond simply our happiness and our human flourishing. As one writer says, and I quote, God's purposes for marriage are on a larger scale in that no other relationship within the family so fully mirrors God's purposes in the universe. No other relationship within the family so fully mirrors God's purposes in the universe. In other words, this amazing good gift by God on the sixth day of creation not only is the basis of human flourishing, but it is as we will see this morning in a little fuller way, a mirror or a picture of God's purposes in this universe. The implications, the realities of that statement will become more and more evident this morning. We are here in the fifth chapter and we are on the fourth message with regard to the role of the husband. This section, verses 22 through 33, where we are talking about biblical authority and submission, here now the role of the husband, we've noted that there are 14 characteristics, 14 characteristics of a husband's authority, and we're looking at them so that we might understand it, appreciate it, and exercise it in a Christ-honoring fashion in our homes and in our marriages. We've looked so far at four of them, All right, just quickly, a husband's authority is unavoidable, a husband's authority is covenantal, a husband's authority is reflective, and a husband's authority is primary. We have looked at all of those. We introduced last week and are returning this week to the fifth of those characteristics, and that is that a husband's authority is loving. A husband's authority is loving. That will be what we speak about this morning. I introduced it last week at the end of the message here in verse 25 where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And we introduced this characteristic that a husband's authority is loving by reflecting on the relationships within the triune Godhead. And in particular, I called out to you a book that I think is one of the finest books that I have read with regard to the Trinity, 
And it's called Delighting in the Trinity by an English author, Michael Reeves. I'm going to review just quickly as we start again this morning what I spoke there about the end of last week to get it into your mind and lay it down as that foundation as we go forward and talk more applicationally about this verse 25. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 that I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. This headship or authority structure is also the channel through which the love of God flows, and that is an important point. It is through the headship structure, through the authority structure within the Godhead, that the love of God flows. For example, the Father is the head and lover of the Son. The Father is the head and lover of the Son. As we noted last time, while the Son certainly loves the Father, it is Christ the Son who is called the Beloved. The Father is not the Beloved, it is the Son who is the Beloved. The Father is the initiator, the Son is the responder. The Father initiates love to the Son eternally, and the Son responds to the Father's love. The Father is the head and lover of the Son. Secondly, the Son is the head and lover of the church. The Son is the head and lover of the church. Christ is the lover, the church is the beloved. Christ is the initiator. The church is the responder. Quoting Reeves, he says, This means that Christ loves the church first and foremost. His love is not a response given only when the church first loves him. His love comes first, and we only love him because he first loved us. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the lover of the church. Christ is the initiator. The church is is the responder. In marriage, the husband is the head and lover of his wife. The husband is the head and lover of his wife. She is the beloved. She is the beloved. And he is called, verse 25 here, to model his love for her after Christ's love for the church. The husband is the initiator. She is the responder. He initiates, she responds. This means that just like the church, his wife is not called upon to earn his love. But again, quoting Reeves here, can enjoy it as something that is lavished upon her freely, unconditionally, and maximally. The father is the head and lover of the son. The son is the head and lover of the church. The husband is the head and lover of the his wife. Do you see how it flows out from the very nature of God? So thinking about that with it as a theological foundation, the command here to love our wives as Christ loves the church, I want to I focus on three, just three aspects. Three aspects in which this love must be displayed. Three aspects in which our love for our wives must be displayed. Here they are. First, a husband's love must be tender. A husband's love must be tender. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19, we find here the ESV translation, which I think is the right one here. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. This verb that's translated harsh here uh, only appears four times in the New Testament. Once here in Colossians 3.19, used by the Apostle Paul, and three times in the book of Revelation, used by John. It's used in Revelation 8.11. And twice in Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That's it. That's the only place it appears. 
In Revelation, it refers to that which enters the stomach and brings bitterness and a violent response. One writer says, and I think he's on onto it here, he says, it speaks of that which is sharp, harsh, or bitter. Sharp, harsh, or bitter. Okay? Husbands, love your wives and do not be sharp, harsh, or bitter with them. Now, why would Paul write that? The reason he would write that is because there is a great temptation as a husband who is also a sinner, or maybe we should say as a foremost sinner and a husband, there is a great temptation to act towards our wives in a way that is harsh, to be harsh with our wives. Through the years in pastoral counseling, I have seen it many, many times. Husbands who are harsh with their wives. And I'm going to give you some examples of ways in which I have observed husbands who are harsh with their wives. I'm not going to take any time to elaborate on them. I'm just going to list them out to you. And I do this to twofold to show you, number one, that it is, a, it is a human condition for men. And secondly, gentlemen, that if you find yourself in any of these, that you will repent. That you will repent. You are being harsh with your wife when you ask them to run the household without giving them enough money to do so. When you ask them to run the household without giving them enough money to do the job. You are being harsh with your wife when you treat her as a domestic servant whose job is to wait on you and clean up after you. You are being harsh when you're with your wife when you prioritize your recreational activities above the needs of the family. You are being harsh with your wife when you are too busy to sit down and talk with her and draw out her hopes, her dreams, and her fears. You are being harsh with your wife when you ridicule or make light of her concerns. You are being harsh with your wife when you provide no means for her to respectfully appeal a decision which you have made and with which she does not agree. You are being harsh with your wife when you refuse to admit that you have made a mistake or ask forgiveness when you sin against her or your children. You are being harsh with your wife when you bring up old sins and mistakes and use them as ammunition in a present conflict. You are being harsh with your wife when you flirt with other women. You are being harsh with your wife when you provide no relief from the pressures and duties of young motherhood. You are being harsh with your wife when you do not take responsibility for the discipline of the children. You are being harsh with your wife when you speak sharply or critically or condescendingly to her. You are being harsh with your wife when you call her names or curse at her. You are being harsh with your wife when you require her to check in with you before every single decision, effectively treating her as an inferior or a minor child. You are being harsh with your wife when you fail to provide spiritual direction and leadership in your home and then grow defensive and angry when she brings it up. These are just a few of the ways that we can be harsh with our wives. And Paul says, love your wife and do not be harsh with her. We are Christian men. And as Christian men, we are called to emulate the love of Christ. And the love of Christ is tender. It is tender. 
And we are called to be tender. Secondly, secondly, a husband's love must be knowledgeable. A husband's love must be knowledgeable. We'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 for Peter's words here. 1 Peter 3, 7. Peter says, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. As with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Peter says to the husbands here in Verses 1 through 6, he's got a lot to say to the wives, but here he speaks to the husbands. And he says, husbands, we are to conduct our relationship with our wives literally according to knowledge. Verse 7, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives according to knowledge. That's what it literally says, according to knowledge. Live with your wife according to knowledge. The question is, what knowledge? What knowledge must a husband take into account in his marriage? What must we know, men, if we are to live according to knowledge? It is a knowledge that takes into account the similarities and differences between men and women. That's what Peter is after here. He gives us that hint for the, re- the need for this when he says... That she, she is weaker because she is a woman. She is weaker because she is a woman. That's the knowledge that we are to live with her in, in accordance with. Husbands, live with your wives according to the knowledge that she is weaker than you. Now what does that mean? What does it mean she is weaker than me? Commentators are somewhat divided. They offer a few possibilities as to what Peter might be after here. Some think he's making a reference to physical strength. Live with your wife according to knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge that you're stronger than she is. Others suggest that it's emotional strength. Live with your wife according to knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge that you are emotionally stronger than she is. A third suggestion is that you are positionally stronger than she is, or conversely said, she is positionally weaker than you. Live with your wife according to knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge that she is in a position of weakness relative to you. Positionally weaker. So what is it? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it positional? Yes. I think it's all of them. I think it's all of them. I think when Peter says we're to live with our wives according to knowledge, it's the knowledge that she is a woman. Do you see it? Right there in the middle of the verse. She is a woman. In other words, she's not a man. News alert. Your wife is not a man. Now you go, of course that's true. The problem is we often treat her like she's a man and then get frustrated when she doesn't respond like a man. Or we are harsh with her because we treat her like a man. Physically. Physically. On average, men are stronger than women. I guess it, you know, does it really have to be said? But I guess it does in the world in which we live. On average, men are stronger than women, right? Go to any golf course, take a look at the tee boxes, okay? Men are stronger than women. That's not really debatable. I think the implications of that are, though, gentlemen, 
is that your wife cannot carry the level of physicality, physical burden that you carry. You have been given by God a certain muscle mass that makes you a man vis-a-vis a woman. And so, is your wife your helpmate? Absolutely. Can she help you in physical tasks? Of course. Can she hang with you and work with you all day long? No. No. Now, before you flood the pulpit afterwards with the exception, the exception merely proves the rule. Okay? Okay? She is physically weaker, for she is a woman. She is emotionally weaker. Women are generally put together with a greater level of sensitivity or or emotional fragility compared to a man. Ask any husband who has unintentionally hurt his wife's feelings, which means any husband who has been married longer than a week. And they will know. They will tell you, yep, it's true. It's true. Women are not, generally speaking, as able to easily wall off their emotions as men can. It's just the way God has made women and men. Men have an incredible ability to be involved in a task and to wall off everything else, and it doesn't really come in. For women, generally, it's just not that way. Life is an eternal present for them. So emotionally. And then third, positionally. Positionally, and, and perhaps this is maybe the one that's, that it, 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 he's speaking of here in the greatest, to the greatest extent. Positionally, in other words, women are called to submit to the authority of their husbands. Right? Verse 5, or in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. And you will become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. What fear? The fear that you are in a positionally weaker position. In other words, that he is your head. He is your head. He is in authority over you. Thus you are in a position where you can be exploited. And human history is filled with examples of men exploiting women. So perhaps that is the biggest thing that Peter is talking about here. I'm not sure. But it's certainly true. Certainly true. In light of all of this, whether it's primarily he's talking physically or emotionally or positionally or all of the above, in light of that, Peter calls on the husband to be considerate of their wives and not take advantage of them. Right? You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives according to knowledge, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Don't take advantage of her. Rather, recognize and honor her as an equal, a fellow heir, he says. In other words, someone created in the image of God and joint heirs with you as a Christian man in God's grace. She is a fellow heir of the grace of life. In other words, the grace of God that brings eternal life. Well, just like their husbands, wives believe in the same Savior. They are redeemed in the same, by the same ransom. They live by the same grace, and they look forward to the same eternal destiny. And so, although, men, you are stronger than her, you are stronger than her, She is your equal. She is your equal as a joint heir of the grace of God. Now, why does Peter say all of this? 
Why does Peter say all that? Why does he insert this here in verse 7? I think the reason he inserts this is because it's hard for men not to think of uh, weakness as inferiority. I think it's really hard for a man to conceive of weakness and not equate it to inferiority. But I think that just shows that we don't have God's thoughts on these things. All right, let me ask you a question. Question for you here. Which is stronger? Which is stronger, a hammer or a teacup? This is not a trick question. Okay? Which is stronger, a hammer or a teacup? A hammer, of course, right? A hammer. Which one is better? Which one is better, a hammer or a teacup? Answer? Depends, doesn't it? I mean, I realize you can use a butter knife to tighten a screw, okay? But it's not what it's for. But you cannot use a hammer to drink tea. You cannot use a hammer to drink tea. So it depends is the answer to the question. Which is stronger, a hammer or a teacup? A hammer is stronger. Which is better? Depends what you're trying to do. Depends what you're trying to do. So weakness is not inferiority. We have to break ourselves of that kind of thought. In other words, we are not in a competition with our wives. Okay? We're not in a competition. Now, this is a serious issue here because look at the warning that Peter gives. He says, listen, blockheads. If you don't get this right, your prayers will be hindered. A failure to value our wife as a weaker vessel will hinder our prayers. It will hinder our prayers as husbands. In other words, if you are out of fellowship with your wife, you are out of fellowship with God. If you are out of fellowship with your wife, gentlemen, you are out of fellowship with God. Does that make sense? A husband's love must be tender. A husband's love must be knowledgeable. Third, a husband's love must be effectual. Go back to the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. A husband's love must be effectual. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives. Stop there. Paul says that husbands are to love their wives in a manner patterned after the self-sacrifice of Christ, verse 25. Then in verses 26 through 27, Paul spells out for us here the goals of Christ's self-sacrificing love, and there are three of them. So verses 26 and 27 contain three goals for Christ's self-sacrificing love. They are to be instructive to us as a husband. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Okay? And then the goal of Christ loving the church is spelled out in verses 26 and 27, three goals. They're, they're, they're linked, they're related. And that's supposed to be instructive. So Jesus loved and delivered himself on behalf of the church. So let's ask a question. The question is, why did Christ die? All right? Right? 
Christ gave himself up, verse 25, for the church. Why? Why did he do this? Verse 26. So that, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Why did Christ die for the church? He died for the church so that he might sanctify or purify or set apart the church. To set her apart as the people of God. Saints by calling, right? Hagias, which comes from the verb hagiazo, to sanctify. That he might sanctify her, that he might make her... A saint or, or saints that you might be set apart. Having cleansed her, look at a verse, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now, this is an interesting metaphor that Paul brings to play here. Remember, the, the topic of discussion here is marriage. So, Paul brings in the metaphor to describe the, 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 the means by which Christ sets apart the church, verse 26, as the bridal bath, the lutron, the bridal bath. What's the bridal bath? Well, it's simple. In ancient times, just before a wedding, the, the, the bride would, would undergo a bath. She would be bathed. And she would be bathed uh, in order so that when she comes together with her husband, she's clean, fresh, pure. Now, you've got to remember, we're talking about a, a, a people that live a hard life close to the land. And, and baths are a relatively modern phenomena and luxury. But for these ancient people, there was a bath that, that the bride would bathe herself her attendants would help her and so forth, okay? And just so you settle this, okay, men would bathe too, okay? I just said that. The men would bathe too. So they would both bathe before the wedding. You know what? We do the same stuff. We do the same thing. Prior to a, to a wedding, the, the groom and the bride, they go through an elaborate procedure, right? The men, they go get their hair cut and, you know, they get shaved and all of that. And women get their hair done and makeup, and all the rest of that stuff. So, so we understand this whole idea that, you, that you're going to put yourself in the best possible position as you come together as husband and wife. Okay? So Paul calls on that tradition that is well known, the idea of, of the bathing and the, and the cosmetics in preparation for meeting her husband, and he uses this idea, this metaphor, to speak about, look at verse 26, to speak about the cleansing effect of the gospel. That they might, having cleansed her by the washing of water, the, the reference there, the metaphor is to the, to the lutron, but, but rather than a bridal bath with water, which is what the, would happen in, you know, in life, he's talking, using that as a metaphor, that Christ washes, purifies his bride, the church, with the word. With the word. In other words, that, that it's the gospel. The gospel has a purifying and setting apart function with the church. Okay? So why did Christ die? He died so that he might purify, sanctify, set apart the people of God, the church. Why? Why does Christ sanctify the church? Verse 27. That, or so that, he might present her, or excuse me, so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Okay. So that he might present the church to himself in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle. So Paul's continuing the metaphor here, the, the wedding metaphor, and he's, and he's picturing a young bride who is dazzlingly beautiful, her glory, okay? And as evidence of her glory, of her dazzling beauty, he points to her, interestingly, her unwrinkled 
an unblemished complexion. Okay? That he might present to himself the church in her dazzling beauty, in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle. So she, her skin is not wrinkled, and, and her complexion is fair. Not fair like good, better, you know, fair, like Song of Solomon kind of fair. <laughs> okay? She has, a, she has a gorgeous complexion. Okay? Why does God set the church apart? So that she might be beautiful so that she might be beautiful. Why? Why does Christ make the church beautiful? The end of verse 27. So that she would be holy and blameless. So that she would be holy and blameless. Okay, so the metaphor is continuing here, but it's, it's changing a little. Now it's the, the bridegroom who becomes the one who beautifies the bride and makes her holy and blameless. So, you know, all metaphors break down. This one's breaking down. But it, it could be a reference here. Uh, people have suggested it, and maybe they're onto something here. Back to Ezekiel 16. Just write it down. Look it up on your own. Ezekiel 16, verses 8 to 14, where there God chooses Israel and, and purifies her and beautifies her and presents her to himself as, a, as his wife. Of course, she proves to be unfaithful in the task, he says there. So Christ is involved in the process of making his wife, his bride, beautiful for the ultimate purpose that she would be holy and blameless. So what is the application to marriage? Verse 28. So husbands, hutos, in the same way, the ESV translates it, in the same way, husbands are obligated to love their wives. So Paul has just used the metaphor of, of, of marriage, or, or excuse me, of wedding and the cleansing process and so forth. And he said, so you husbands, or in the same way you husbands, you are obligated to love your wives. You're obligated to love your wives. Okay? All right? Love your wives as Christ loves the church. How does Christ love the church? Sets her apart beautifies her, makes sure she's holy and blameless. Okay. So let's see if we can apply this. I think we can say that a husband's love for his wife is to be a cleansing kind of love. A cleansing kind of love. And the cleansing takes place through the word. Through the word. In other words, gentlemen... As husbands, we play a vital role in leading our wives in the study of the Scriptures, in the application of the Gospel. Okay? We can also say that a husband's love is to be a beautifying love, verse 27, first part of the verse. It's to be a beautifying love. In other words, your wife's attractiveness is to a large extent the result of your husbanding. Now, as husbands, we have no control over the aging process, right? No control over the aging process, but we do have a large influence over the, how those years reveal themselves in our wives' faces and dispositions. In other words, the longer you are married to your wife, the prettier she should become. She should be prettier now than the day you married her. That's your test. Right? After years of living together as husband and wife, you loving her as Christ loves the church, will your wife be haggard and harsh or beautiful and sweet? That's the question. That's the question. With its ultimate purpose, the end of verse 27, is to promote the moral purity of your wife. Her moral purity. This is why you, you 
um, bring the scriptures to bear in your marriage, gentlemen. All right. When God loves us, he gives us what we need, not necessarily what we want, right? He gives us what we need, not necessarily what we want. As a husband, loving our wives as Christ loves the church, it's required of us, you can go to 1 Peter 3, 7, to be a student of both the scriptures and our wives so that we might give them what they need and not necessarily what they want. Okay, I told you last week that I had something I thought would surprise you. Okay? The command to love your wife as Christ loves the church is not a command to give her every single thing she wants. Okay? So, live with your wife in a way that promotes her beauty and her holiness by washing her with the word. Ask yourselves these questions, gentlemen. What are your wife's weaknesses? Can you identify them? Do you know them? What are her weaknesses? Where does her faith tend to falter? Do you know? What is the best way to approach her in order to call her back to the gospel? What's the best way to approach your wife to call her back to the gospel when her faith is faltering? When is it the loving thing to say no to your wife's desires or requests? When is it the right thing, the loving thing, the proper thing to say no? What if she does not want to read the word and pray together right now? What will you do and how will you do it? Perhaps it's a consequence of our own poor and inconsistent husbanding. We have to consider that possibility. All right. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Gentlemen, you cannot do this. You cannot do this in your own strength. This is not a pull myself up by my bootstraps and try a little bit harder. This requires a full dependence upon the Spirit of God to work in and through you as the Scriptures shape your heart and you help shape hers. Okay? Let's pray. Father, the... The goal and responsibility of husbanding is great. And the role model is Christ. And our Father, the task is too much for us in our own strength. It is impossible. It is, it is designed to drive us to the gospel. We cannot live out the Christian life apart from the gospel. Even as this entire section begins, we have to be filled by your Spirit. I pray, Father, that you would help us as husbands to love our wives tenderly, to love our wives according to knowledge, and to love our wives effectually. Oh, Lord, please forgive us for our failures and shortcomings and help us to fulfill our holy task. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.